Hey, live on tape from Hollywood, it's the Notaku Podcast. Uh, I'm not Craig Ferguson, and I don't have a robot skeleton or secretariat with me, but what I do have is Setsuken. How are you doing, Setsuken? Watashi wa Setsuken desu. Oh, very nice. Let me just clarify, because I know I mangle it probably 50% of the time, since I probably pronounce it 50-50. Setsuken or Setsuken? Setsuken. Um, that's what I thought. It's not really a Japanese word, so yeah, that's just the pronunciation I chose for it. Yeah. So See, I know it's Setsuken, but I, I half the time I say Setsuken anyway, just because it's my American uh, linguistic uh, trends creeping in anyway. Uh, anyway, okay, so welcome, and uh, always great to hear from everyone again. This is indeed Notaku Podcast. My goodness, it's number four, isn't it? And uh, we're growing. Uh, we appreciate the support from our audience. We're going to try to keep down our ums and you knows. At least I will. Uh, and uh, it's great to be back with Setsuken, whose name I just pronounced correctly, and all of our listeners out there. Uh, I hope it's been a good week for you, Setsuken. How's the weather back there in the Midwestern United States? Not too bad here. Um, I know that uh, unlike the poor place where Hurricane Katrina hit, they're getting a something else again. So that's been scary. And I know some viewers in Asia have been getting like, I know there's been flooding in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So uh, my heart goes out to all the people that were affected by the bad weather. I have been mostly okay, just kind of chilling. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good to hear. I mean, here it's just been the kind of normal, only even more so in the era of climate change, Japanese mushiatsui, hot, humid summer weather, which sucks, but uh, we haven't hit, we're in typhoon season theoretically here. So something like what's happening with Laura down in the Gulf could happen here anytime, but nothing so far this season. In a selfish sort of way, I almost wish it would because after a typhoon hits, it inevitably gets cooler for a few days. But uh, that's very selfish indeed because they cause a lot of trouble for people too. So uh, anyway, this is indeed the Notaka Podcast. And we want to start this week as we like to do now with uh, a little bit of feedback from some of our listeners. Uh, we'll start with Jan, who uh, kindly let us know that uh, searching for us on Overcast is not finding us. And just to let you know, uh, that does happen. Uh, we, we're already listed on a couple of, uh, podcast trackers and eventually we're hoping to be on things like iTunes and such when should be soon, but it does take a while for, uh, it does take a while for the name to be indexed and, and this come up in searches and such. Is that not the case, Setsuken? Yep. Yep. I finally submitted stuff this past week. So we're in review on a bunch of places, Spotify, iTunes, like you mentioned, Google podcasts. So once those get approved, and they did get validated, so once they get approved, we should start popping up on feeds and searches and all that stuff. Which will be uh, which will be great. And again, though, for finding us wherever you're finding us, be that on uh, be that on YouTube, wherever it is you're finding us, we definitely appreciate it. And of course, uh, we also have feedback from CK Louis CK or just CK. I don't know. Just wanted to say I'm really enjoying the podcast. Been watching anime only for a few years, so not too familiar with a lot of the history, older shows, and find your discussions very interesting. And I know we find those discussions very interesting, too, because we love talking about the older anime that made anime fans out of us. Uh, and again, he mentioned specifically not keeping up on anime news himself so I, or herself, and I enjoy hearing that segment as well. Uh, and I think I think the news segment has proved to be a very popular thing. Very useful as a service for people who don't have the opportunity to read Ann or Crunchyroll or wherever the news stories pop up every week. So if we can collate those for you and make it a little easier for you to digest them, uh, we're happy to perform that service. And so uh, we're definitely not cutting back on the news segment. It's definitely proved to be very popular. And Okay, here we go. So our first major segment, as you know, is... So let's just jump right in, Setsuken. Uh, any changes in your in your status board with uh, what you're following? Any any big developments on the shows you are following? Yes, sir. I actually caught up on a bunch of stuff that uh, stuff that you had talked about, stuff that we had talked about. So I caught up on Millionaire Detective, Fugo Keiji, uh, Balance Unlimited, which um, well, actually, I got as far as episode six, 
So I've yet to see seven, which came out this week, but really liking it. I liked it a lot more than I think a lot of people had been telling me. They said it it had been uneven. I think you had said so as well. I liked every episode I saw. So okay, that's good. This is this is like my jam. This is my kind of thing. The comedy is really working for me. The dynamic between the main cast, the the little mysteries, all that stuff. So quite enjoying it. I mean, it's not a work of art. And as I mentioned last week, uh, given the people involved, I expected more, but it's it's still really, really good if I disconnect my expectations from who's involved. Um, beyond that, I also uh, caught up on Great Pretender, or rather, I started Great Pretender. So I got through the first arc, really, really liked it. You were right. Episode one, it was a great opener, really exciting, really interesting. Um, so highly recommend that and I'll hopefully be getting through the rest pretty soon. And then, um, just following ReZero and Yahari as always. Yeah, I'm with you on Millionaire Detective, although I did find the the first four episodes to be uneven for me. Uh, everything since then, including seven, which just aired yesterday, I've found to be quite strong. I, I like the fact that, uh, it's, it's a show that, stylistically it does change from week to week it, it it experiments a little bit in terms of in terms of its stylistic approach some are more comedy driven some is more kind of your traditional cop show motif then we're getting into a big sort of a mystery suspense politics kind of thing now so yeah it, it's a really good show great pretender i've kind of talked about that as nauseum but really like that show a lot the first arc is great the second arc is equally great and totally different which is again i think i Variety really does help us uh, with a show to sort of stay with it. Not watching Ray Zero, but that's okay. Everything else on my block, pretty much the same as it was last time we talked. Apari Ranman, still kind of just good enough to be following and covering, enjoying that. I mentioned Hyoge Mono, back to, back to covering that. Only two episodes left of Say Ray No More Beto, but I really have to psych myself up to watch those last two episodes because emotionally I know they're going to kick my ass just as they always do. And, uh, that's, yeah, I always have, I've had a lot of commenters on my site saying, how come it's taking you so long to watch the same no more beat though? And it, I'm like, well, I, I don't want to feel sad. <laughs> so I know those last two episodes, they will make me, they'll, they'll, they'll absolutely, they'll absolutely, they'll, they'll leave me for dead by the side of the road because they always do. So I will watch them. I will cover them. It remains my favorite anime, episode, anime series of all time. And we could talk about it in news, but I'll just throw a quick note in here now. Just, it is official now. Sentai Filmworks did do their announcement that they're releasing it on Blu-ray in English. So, and that's going to be available September 29th for those of you that would like to finally own this series on Blu-ray, which you very well should. So that's my what you're watching. So not a lot of news there for me because I'm kind of following the same stuff, but it's possible that there could be some other news that's worth talking about. I wonder if there is. The anime. Yeah, you know what? There is there is news to talk about. There's always news to talk about in anime. News is dropping fast and furious. And we mentioned the Sentai Seiryu no Morita thing. Another thing I want to make people aware of is we've already talked about the whole situation with, with the Act Age manga and that sort of ugly situation that, that, that developed with that. But uh, we do want to uh, just mention that if one of you would like to, if you'd like to follow this story, Uz- Uzaki, uh, Uzaki Shiro, who is the artist who is really one of the unfortunate victims of this whole situation, she did issue an official statement for anyone out there that would like to go out and, and check it out. We won't get into that story again, because like I said, we we discussed it at length already. But if you want to read her official statement, it is out there and it, it mostly follows the same kind of format of what we discussed where she's, you know, she's, she's, she approves of the decision that was made. She thinks it was the only possible decision that could be made. And, but she's disappointed that the manga ended prematurely. And I don't blame her because I'm sure she was very invested. Another manga that has a similar relationship of a male and female artist and writer team 
and is of course Watamonte, which is uh, a series I, I loved a lot. The manga is still ongoing. The anime was only one season, sadly, but quite excellent. And I did want to make people aware that there is a new manga from the writing team who let themselves, who make themselves known as Nico Tanagawa. But like I say, it's actually two people, a man and a woman. Uh, they have started a new manga. This story comes to us from Alex Mateo at Anime News Network. And Watamote's Nico Tanagawa launches new manga. And the new manga is called Kaihin Shogakuen no Shurishiriharu. And it's set in a boys' high school dormitory. Just launching this month on the Manga One app. And we'll see whether it's a serialization or whether she just, he, she intends to do it just as a short term. But uh, as a very interesting manga team, I'm always interested when they come out with something new. It'll be interesting to see where they go with this. Uh, Satsuken, do you follow Watamote at all? I think we've discussed it a little bit. I've seen some of the anime series. I, it's one of those series that I watched a couple of episodes, liked, and then for some reason, real life got in the way and I never finished. Um, I might just jump straight into the manga for this one just because it's been long enough that I can just, you know, I'm divorced enough from the anime as excellent as it is. And since it cuts off at a certain point, I might as well just jump into the manga. But this story excites me a little bit. Um, uh, it it seems very similar in style just from the way the, the main artwork is in the article. Uh, the main guy seems like he's uh, got one of those interesting faces that uh, Watamode had in its uh, original series as well. So excited to see what they do with the boys' dormitory setting as well. Yeah, it's different enough in theme. If it becomes an ongoing series, it'll be very interesting because, you know, Watamote is a great series, primarily from the teenage female perspective. Although there are a couple of male characters, including the brother, but it'll be interesting to see how they handle it going at it from a male perspective this time. Watamote, again, you know, it's, it's very interesting if you have any kind of personal connection with someone in your family or close friends who deal with social anxiety or depression, which I, I have not personally, but I have family members. I definitely recognize the authenticity that goes into the writing for that series. It clearly the writer understands this topic very well so it was very interesting to see to see that play out and if you are a fan of of watamote or if you like the like the anime and have not been following the manga i because we're not likely to ever see a second season of the anime i would recommend you pick up the manga because it really evolves and changes a lot and so does kuroko the main character she she doesn't she's not stagnant she 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 does change she evolves and so does the story. So those are the kind of manga I like where you have a real arc. It's not just uh, the same kind of gag repeated over and over. And this is definitely not that sort of series. I heard a lot of people saying, oh, it'll never change. It's always the same. Well, you're wrong. It did. So anyway, new manga. Uh, quick question. Quick question. Yes. Sorry. Um, why do you think it'll never get a second season? No reason why it should. The manga is not hugely popular. It's modestly popular. It's not hugely popular. It doesn't have any kind of merchandising there's no idol tie-ins doesn't have a particularly famous seiyu cast involved in it and it doesn't fit any of the house of pies neat slices of uh commercial slices of the pie that we normally like to see production committees decide based on no risk and there's really no obvious way for this series to make money I think the initial season came out, as it often did, as a one-shot to promote sales of the manga. And I, it may have succeeded in that, but those sorts of adaptations generally do their one core and they're done. They, they, they're out there to raise awareness of the manga, and then once it's over, it's over. It doesn't generate enough money to, to convince them to make more. Which is in contrast to something like Shonen Jump, right? Because yes. I had a similar opinion of Shokugeki no Soma, but that is getting a full adaption at this point, the adaptation, because it boosted the manga enough. So did this not boost sales enough to where it's relevant? We're talking about elephants and elephants and and capybaras here. I mean, you know, Shokugeki, which for the record, like the first two seasons after that, jumped the shark hard, in my opinion, 
it's much bigger seller, much bigger seller than Watamote. You know, three, four times the volume sales. It's not the top dog at Weekly Shonen Jump, but even a high middle dog, which is what it is at Jump, is still a pretty big in the overall sea. That Shonen Jump is still the, the biggest fish in the manga sea sales wise. So this would probably have generally been for most of its run anywhere from third to fifth or sixth uh, in any ongoing battle of uh, serializations in terms of sales. So it's a big series, big enough that the manga itself could generate, uh, could, could manga sales itself can generate enough income for that to be worthwhile. Watamote, nowhere near big enough. Makes sense. And thank you for all that information. The reason I asked those questions is because somebody did tell me offhandedly that some things we assume that people know they might not. So that extra context, I think, helps me and it helps the viewers kind of discern, you know, why something might get a second season and why it might not. Yeah, good point. And and it's worth remembering that the amount of, of uh, coverage or the amount of impact something has in, in English language fandom is not always a, an accurate reflection of the amount of impact it has in, in the Japanese side. It can be a bit of a funhouse mirror kind of a situation where the reflection is much bigger or much smaller. Things that we assume are very big because they get they make a splash here are pretty niche in Japan. And sometimes the opposite, something can be huge in Japan and cast almost no shadow. And so a lot of English language fans assume, assume it's a minnow rather than a whale. So a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. We can't we can't assume based on how much of uh, you know how much exposure something gets in in the West, uh, how big it may be in Japan because those two things are not always connected. Yeah, Shingeki no Kyojin or Boku no Hero, those are huge everywhere. But there's a lot of things where th- there's a pretty big difference. So a good point. Thank you for thank you for bringing that up. So anyway, go out and read uh, Tanigawa Niko's new manga. Uh, let's see. Another thing I think we should talk about is new membership tiers at Crunchyroll. It seems like we've uh, we've talked about this a lot, uh, but uh, Crunchyroll is you know we talked about last week Setsuken about or maybe it was the week before about the one point five billion dollar asking price and and they were AT and T had put on them. Now we find out this is a story from Forbes from David Bloom. Crunchyroll adding two high-end tiers for most devoted fans. So AT&T owned anime streaming service Crunchyroll is launching two new pricing tiers beginning today. This was dated uh, a few days ago. And so there's an $8 a month subscription tier fan. Uh, There's a mega fan, which is $10 a month. That adds offline viewing and access to four concurrent screens. So uh, streams, it also, well, screams would be even better. It also provides deals in the Crunchyroll merchandise store. And then, so the fan, the $8 one, I think was the existing one. Then we finally have the ultimate fan, which is $15 a month. And that they get six concurrent screams or streams and an annual swag bag of merch uh, plus access to like limited edition stuff and all viewing is ad free. So uh, basically they're pricing it on a par with stuff like HBO Max at this point. Um, so what do you think, Satsuken? What do you think about Crunchyroll adding these new tiers? Do you think they'll do you think fans will respond to this? Or do you think it's just another another kind of a desperation money grab kind of a thing? Well, as a customer, this news, I was looking at this the other day. This was not good news. It it definitely seems a bit tone deaf and I suspect the reason they're doing it is to show that $60 or, or whatever it was, that huge value per subscriber. Uh, this would be more in line with what they were talking about when the $1.5 billion sale was happening or what when we heard about it. I don't think this is a good idea. I personally, as somebody who does subscribe to Country Roll, I like paying the $60 a year and then just kind of forgetting about it. Yes, it's nice that they finally added the ability to download uh, anime to your device like Netflix does. But honestly, that and the concurrent st- streams and s- probably some screams from people who don't want this, um, <laughs> that is is really just a family plan. So they basically created two tiers of family plans, which is weird because every other streaming service has one tier of family plan. Or if you go for something like Amazon or Netflix, 
They just have one family plan. So, I mean, really, they're competing price-wise with things like Netflix and Amazon and HBO and Hulu, like you mentioned, and they don't nearly have the wealth of content to compete. Yes, they have some animes. Uh, They have anime. They have some of it, though, not all of it. They have some manga that they release every now and then. Their manga viewer isn't terribly great. Um, And then they have a bunch of really, really old live action stuff like K-dramas and J-dramas, I believe. But I mean, Netflix blows them out of the water in that category. So it it seems like a huge mistake. Uh, The swag bag and that kind of stuff, that doesn't really do it for me. I shop from Amazon or some other place or Right Stuff, I think is another good website. They have nice deals. So I don't know what Crunchyroll is doing. Uh, I did not see people receive this very warmly or get very excited about it. But yeah, that's that's my thing. It just seems like a mistake to me. Yeah, I, I, I the response I was seeing is like you said, not necessarily not necessarily warm. It's almost like they're adopting the uh, Japanese DVD Blu-ray model of adding a lot of fluff and charging more and hoping people will pay it. That's almost the vibe I get from this. But as you say, it's all tied into trying to make it more attractive as a $1.5 billion sale piece, I think. And that's, that's very interesting. Now I'm just curious, are you also Funimation the subscriber or only Crunchyroll? Yes, sir. I subscribe to Funimation, Crunchyroll, Netflix, and Amazon. So all four of the anime and I did high dive at one point, but only the season they had, uh, that photography show, Tadakun is uh, mm. in love or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Tadakun, yeah. Ta- Tadakun uh, never, fall, never Falls in Love, or I think is what it was called. Pretty good show, yes. actually. Not not great, but pretty good. Um, now, let me ask you, if you just, out of, as a area of, an aside of interest to me, would you also find that Crunchyroll's player, while not the top of the line by any means is among the two big, big, big anime streamers, vastly superior to Funimation's. It is superior. I think the there's different issues with each. So I primarily view anime on my big TV and that's connected to my PlayStation four or through the internal like TV app. So for that, I think Crunchyroll and Funimation are both about the same. Crunchyroll's a little better, but there's weird stuff that happens. Like sometimes a simulcast will say that it's out uh, even on the title screen. But when you go to view the actual episode, the episode is missing. And so you'll have to wait a couple of hours for the episode to update. I remember when Attack on Titan and some of the bigger shows were airing, the the episodes would just, their, their app would just go down entirely. I think for Funimation, it was the same thing. Dragon Ball Z, when it came out, it would just crash their servers. So Issues like that, I think, is why they get a bad reputation. And for Crunchyroll specifically, they just released their new player last year after using a really outdated HTML5 one for years and years and years. So from the tech side, yes, Crunchyroll is like 2% better than Funimation, (laughs) but not by much. Okay, fair enough. Actually, if I were Crunchyroll in the marketing team there, I think what I would be doing is Whatever level, whatever tier people have to get to to get rid of the Bruto ads, I think just market that and you'll you'll sell millions of them. Just say, just pay this much, no more Bruto ads, and I think people will go full force. Okay, so Crunchyroll gets more pub from us, uh, and it, always interesting to follow what's going on there and and ongoing in the future. There's other things we could talk about with Crunchyroll too, with like their translators, and um, but again, that's a rabbit hole. Maybe we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, on to some happier news, a series we've briefly touched on here, Kanata no Astra, Astra Lost in Space. Uh, this is a story from my anime list um, from Subasa Lover. Uh, whether that's Captain Subasa or Subasa Reservoir Chronicle, I don't know, but thank you, Subasa Lover. Uh, the 2019 award, um, this was for a the Science Fiction Award, Seiyun Award. And the Best Animation Award went to Kanada no Astra, the 51st Saiyan Award. So congratulations to Kanada no Astra. It's a series I really liked a lot. And one of the things I talked about, Setsuken, last week with a certain manga, one of which I may be discussing even at some point this week. But 
is a series that is exactly the right length. It's not too long and it's not too short. And one of the things I love about Kanada no Astra, both as a manga and as an anime, is that it's a series that's not too long, it's not too short, it's exactly the right length, which I love about it. And the manga was quite popular. It it could have gone on longer. It would have it probably would have kept selling, but the the mangaka knew exactly what he needed to do, and he finished it when he was ready to finish it. It's a great short series that happened to be perfect fit for an anime of about fifteen episodes. And very smartly, the anime team used a little bit of trickery. They managed to talk the production committee into giving them a double episode in there. And then they mostly got rid of the OP and EDs. And as a result of that, they squeezed about two extra episodes worth of content in. And they managed to give it an an adaptation that fit like a glove. So a really good series, just a great classic old school, big hearted anime sci-fi with just the right, to me, just the right combination of genuine emotion, danger, and also kind of goofy, innocent humor. So congratulations to Astra. And I think you're a fan of this too, aren't you? Yes, sir. I loved Astra. But before I get into that, I did want to say, Subasa lover, do you think he just likes wings? Because Subasa is wings in Japanese, right? Oh, I, it seems possible. But given that it's MAO, I'm going to guess there's probably a connection to one or the other of the more anime manga specific Subasa. But who knows? You could be right. I, I just find it amusing that there's this guy who's just like all about wings. Like buffalo anything. wings? Do you mean that kind of thing? Or Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Now you're making me hungry, man. You could be uh, right. You could be right. But as for Astra, I love that show. It was... So we and we've talked about this before. Sci-fi is a genre that just doesn't get enough in it these days in terms of anime, uh, manga. Definitely, there's still I'm sure a lot out there. But as primarily an anime watcher these days, I miss sci-fi. I miss space anime, uh, anime set in space. So it was really, really, really nice to get something like this, and it was a nice merger between I think the old sci-fi. And some of the newer stuff, you know, the high school uh, drama, comedy stuff, but like not toned up to 11. So it was it was it was very nice. And I'm glad it got some awards. I'm honestly a bit surprised it did. I I liked it, but I also kind of got the vibe. And this is maybe a East versus West thing, like you said earlier. But I got the vibe that not many people saw it or viewed uh, viewed it that highly in the U.S. And. To another earlier point you made, maybe it was because it was on Funimation and not one of the other services. That's possible. Uh, You know, the places where I follow uh, commentary and such for anime, uh, which would be, you know, places like my site or uh, Lost in Anime or even like Anime Suki, something like that. I would say I saw a fair amount of discussion on Kanada no Astra, so I got the sense that it was modestly popular. Uh, and it's not like it's not like Tokyo Ghoul or or uh, or Demon Slayer in Japan. It's not like huge, but it is quite it is it's mainstream. It's quite mainstream popular. It has more crossover than most anime do. Uh, it so the general public really likes it more than they do in the case of many anime and manga. So uh, you know, it's just a, it's it's the sort of series that, as you would expect, given its tone, given its content, it's not real it's not real clique specific. It's more just a general interest show that a lot of people with a lot of different tastes seem to find something in it to like, which I think is very easy to understand. And I, I, one last point I would make with regards to, with regards to anime sci-fi, there is obviously, as you said, with manga, there's still plenty of sci-fi because manga is the Pacific ocean, but even in anime, there's a fair amount of sci-fi still, not as much as when it was the dominant genre, but there's a fair amount of it. But there isn't a lot of space anime. And I'm thinking of stuff like, you know, Uchu no Stelvia and, you know, stuff really kind of classic old school space anime. And there isn't as much of it as there as as I'd like. And and I, I do miss it. I miss it a lot because... Even before I became an anime fan, I was a sci-fi fan. I mean, that's the stuff I was reading from the time I was in grade school. I was reading Asimov and Bradbury by the time I was 10. So I'm a huge sci-fi fan from way back. And, you know, I love especially space-oriented anime sci-fi. So I, I do, I wish like crazy we would get more of it. It would be awesome if we did. 
Okay, so congratulations to uh, congratulations to Kanata no Astra, and let's talk a little bit about another series I really like, uh, and I think you do too, which is uh, which is Hataraku Mausama, uh, which started out as a started out as a light novel, still is a light novel. Got an I got a manga ap- uh, adaptation that was quite popular. And eventually got an anime. And we can talk about the news this week. The news is from our, our third our third co-host, Rafael Antonio Pineda at Anime News Network. The Devil is a part-timer manga near climax. So the manga adaptation is finishing on September 26th. And I, I don't see any specific mention in here of the light novel finishing. So maybe the light novel itself is going to continue. But the manga is finishing on September 26th. Uh, you know, you're a fan of this series too, yes? You like you like The Devil is a Part-Timer? Yes, sir. And actually, I heard, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, but I heard that the, the light novel did end, or it, at the very least, it resolved the core pairing question, you know, the, uh, okay, the coupling okay. thing. Okay. And people were not happy. I, I don't want to spoil anything. I, I don't but know. As, as is often the case with stuff like this, People were very, very angry, and I think there was a lot of vitriol that was being thrown at the author of this uh, light novel. Interesting. And so some people said, you know, it ruined the the whole show for them and stuff like that. And so, yeah, um, it's interesting that the manga is ending now because that thing happened a couple of weeks ago. I think it was before we started doing the podcast again. And so... It'll be interesting to see if the manga takes a different route with regards to that, because that does sometimes happen. Sometimes happen. The light novel will go one direction, and the manga adaptation or the the anime may sometimes take a different route. I, that's exactly what popped into my mind when you said that. I wonder now if that is indeed the case, whether the manga will will take a different uh, route. As just for the record, the uh, the the manga is by Akio Hiragi, and the uh, the light novel is Satoshi Wagahara. It it is one of my favorite light novel adaptations that ever made it to anime, certainly in the modern era. And what I would actually just wanted to briefly ask this question, you know, that series sold really well. It 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 was like five five figures, like eleven, twelve thousand per volume, as I remember on Blu-ray and DVD when it came out. And it's it really, really surprises me that that never got a second season. And I it's one of those shows where I've never been able to figure out Usually you can find an obvious reason because, you know, commercial factors are like water. It One way or another, inevitably it flows and things follow a logical course. And this not getting a second season of anime is not logical from a commercial standpoint because it definitely made money as a in the first season. It's definitely popular. Do you have any theories on why this series did not get a second season? I honestly don't. I remember reading an interview of the light novel author. And he was uh, mentioning to fans how he was kind of tired of being asked about this. Mm. He said that he, it was, it was something above his pay grade. So he said that he did not resist this. And he said he was trying his best to finish the story and stuff like that. And that he, he definitely wanted there to be a second season, but he also mentioned that this wasn't something that was up to him. So that was, I think a year or two ago or a couple of years ago, I know a bunch of YouTubers did some videos on this and they hmm. quoted that interview, but nobody knows. And it's been one of the big mysteries of why exactly that happened. Yeah. Another one that pops to mind and it hasn't been quite as long. So it may be that uh, it may be that it's still coming, although it's been longer than it should have been is uh, uh, Gekan Shoujo Nozaki-kun, which was another uh, anime adaptation this time of a straight manga which was very popular, sold very well, critically very well received and no second season. Uh, so another one that kind of makes no sense. You could look at something like Hozaki no Tetsu and say, oh my gosh, why didn't that get a second season? Well, it eventually did and eventually got a third. But the reason it took so long is because it was a wit show and wit as chronically was overworked and took a long time to come out with second seasons of stuff you expected them to come up with second seasons of. And eventually, in fact, uh, Hozaki shifted to another studio. 
uh, Dean, if I remember correctly. So, but there's been, so there was an obvious reason for that. There's no obvious reason for this. And indeed, no obvious reason with Nozaki-kun uh, that, I, that I'm aware of. But anyway, so that's there. So the, the manga is ending. We'll see if it indeed avoids this light novel controversy and gives it, gives it a different ending. And for the record, we didn't spoil it. And I don't know what the light novel ending is anyway, so I couldn't even if I wanted. And the one story I wanted to, I definitely wanted to talk about this story last is uh, this week saw the 10th anniversary of the passing of the great Kon Satoshi, who is you know, in the pre-Hosada, pre-Shinkai days at least, was probably the most prominent anime theatrical filmmaker after the the Ghibli team of Takahata and Miyazaki. Someone who was internationally acclaimed, who uh, got a lot of positive Film Festival and International International Festival Awards was well respected in in Hollywood. Uh, he passed away uh, ten years ago, and his last film, in fact, was supposed to be Dreaming Machine. And Maruyama San, the original founder of Mappa and Madhouse, uh, then uh, M Three Studios, which he formed specifically to try to get this made, is still working on trying to get this film made. So there's been talk about it, but nothing concrete. He died at the age of just 46, Kon Satoshi, left us way, way, way too soon. Um, He was the inspiration for Christopher Nolan, (laughs) but that's a controversial topic. But yes, Paprika was a very inspirational film in many ways. We don't like to talk about it, I suppose, but yes, it was plagiarized. So uh, I wanted to get sort of your general take on the Kon Satoshi oeuvre, if you will, Setsuken. Which of his films in particular, do you remember seeing any of them and did any of them make an impact on you? For me, certainly, uh, Paprika on the theatrical side was the film that most made an impact on me. And I also really enjoyed Paranoia Agent, which was his venture into series TV anime. Had some flaws, but at its best was certainly one of the most brilliant anime of its decade. Yeah, Satoshi Kon, I I, I won't get too much into him because I think at some point we want to do a deep dive topic on him. But just very quickly, I think one of the things that I love about him is how visual he is as a anime director and like stuff like Tokyo Godfathers, Paprika, like you mentioned, Paprika was very visual in how it was done. Uh, Millennium Actress, I think you mentioned that a, a couple of uh, episodes ago or an episode ago. That one was really good. Perfect Blue was oh, really good. Perfect Blue, yeah. So his his style was very unique and it's unique enough that even people who don't watch like a lot of anime or anime film, know of him. I I know uh, a popular YouTuber abroad in Japan, people who probably listen to our stuff probably know of him as well, does a lot of travel, Japanese blog video stuff. He knows about that guy, and he doesn't watch anime and stuff like that. So I think it's... Satoshi Kon's one of those unique names, uh, probably like how the studio Ghibli is a unique name that most people will know of if they're familiar with film film and animation in general. Well, I know Christopher Nolan knows about him, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, Inception, at the inception of this discussion, I think we should talk about uh, <laughs> what what do you think, I mean, well, I won't even ask you. It's not a fair question because we have no idea. But certainly one powerful aspect of this for me is just, just the idea of, you know, what this man's career just I should mention also that the specifically the one story you can go out and check out is from Japan Times, which is a, a great resource for Japanese news in English. This is by uh, Matt Schley. Uh, but this is a big enough story that you'll find references to it everywhere. Uh, Ten years, big anniversary. We'll never know, you know, what when you think about the great filmmakers, anime and otherwise, you know, most of their great films happened in their 50s, 60s he died at 46 when you think about all the stuff he might have done you know if he had lived uh it's boy that's that's the that's the thing for me is just is just the realization that so much great anime we we could have had that we never got uh because because he passed away so soon but i just want to give a shout out to mariyama who is you know to me he's also trying to get pluto 
um, Tetsuka's Pluto manga made into an anime. And if you've ever read Pluto, uh, you know it's one of the it's arguably Tetsuka's finest work. It deserves it deserves to to be an anime, and and there's talk of that. That that's there's even been you know some pre production that's pretty far along. There's but whether that happens or not, it's it, again, it's the same thing with Dreaming Machine. We don't know. Mariyama's doing his best. Mariyama Masao, we certainly hope so. Uh, he's a great man. He's in his 80s. He's not in the best of health. He's given so much to anime. Uh, he's trying to give a couple of gifts to anime, a couple more gifts. It would be a capstone on a fantastic career. As I say, basically founded Madhouse and MAPPA and M3 Studios. So hopefully, by the way, there is some talk. Uh, that the studio owner, the one who's always cooking for people in Shirobako, is based on uh, Mariyama Masao. So it gives you an idea of how well liked he was by the people who, who work with him. Um, so hopefully he's successful in bringing Dreaming Machine and Pluto to our screens. But whether he is or not, that's a name that anime fans should know because he's been a fantastic, fantastic uh, figure for, for anime, a real, a real servant. Of, of anime fans worldwide and someone who does it for the love of it. So Mariyama Masao, uh, one of the great champion of uh, Kon Satoshi after his passing. Yes. And on that note, I think um, to what you said earlier about, you know, it's tragic that he passed away. I think the, in some ways, like his spirit lives on, I believe in a lot of the, the people that he's influenced and, you know, what he's given to anime with some of his work i think his works live on their impact lives on so that's the way i choose to look at it is you know it's it's definitely tragic when you lose a talent um but that's also the reality of life you know uh some people will go they will leave their mark on an industry and then other people will be influenced from that and involve evolve the medium further so that that's that's the positive way i look at it that's a great way to look at it. And there's absolutely no question that artistically, creatively, he has made a big impact and influenced a whole generation of, of animators and writers as well, I might add. So, uh, yes. And uh, that's just a good way to wrap up our new segment, remembering the great Kan Satoshi. But that's not a way to wrap up a podcast, because as our listeners know, we at Nataku have many more things to talk about than just the news. Uh-huh. Okay, let's move on to, at least this week for me, my favorite topic. Uh, we always, uh, we'd like to take a deep dive into the, or a dive into the deep end, if you will. And this time around, we're going to touch on something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is manga series that could be great anime. And that's, boy, I could sit here and literally, well, my voice would give out, but I could talk about this for days. But we did want to talk about as opposed to just being kind of like a manga recommendation, specifically manga that we thought would make great anime. And what with so many light novels being made into anime these days, this is an even more, more both relevant and maybe a little wish fulfillment topic for us, but especially we do, we do have a lot of manga titles that we love that we think would, would be terrific in the anime format. And it, these could be current, these could be older, you know, we we had no influence over each other's selections here. We just we just said let's pick some titles that we really want to talk about, and and go with it. So I'll let you go first if you don't mind. And uh, which manga that would make a great anime would you like to talk about first? So I'm going to talk about what is probably my favorite and probably my most tragic manga of all time because it got canceled, which is MX Zero, and this is by um, the guy who did Pretty Face. Yasuhiro Kano and he's he's coming out with a new manga soon but this was probably my favorite manga by him and it's it's a very interesting show and it's it's kind of like a Japanese version of Harry Potter I feel like except the main character in this uh, manga does not have any magic powers so he ends up in a magical school where everybody's learning how to use magic and stuff like that but he actually does not have any magic powers and he has to get by in this school and not get caught. And it, it, it gets more interesting than that. But this was a, sh- this, this actually ran in Shonen Jump and it ran for, I believe 90 or so chapters, 99 chapters. 
Um, and then it was canceled unceremoniously. It didn't do very well in Japan, but every person I've talked to who's read this has absolutely loved it. I think in the West, particularly, this would do very, very well. It's got romance. It's got high school comedy. It's It's got all the boxes, I think, that would make it popular perhaps today uh, more so than it did back then, because back then, uh, yeah, there was stuff like To Love Rue and stuff like that, but romance and more off-kilter stuff was just not popular in Shonen Jump, I suspect at the time. I don't know. I've always been racking my brain as to why this got canceled, because I could just see anime, anime, anime on this one. Did you ever read MX Zero, Guardian Enzo? Wow, I have to say, uh, this is really an interesting one to me, because... I instinctively don't think I've ever even heard of it. I, it, it, it brought up no, when I, when I heard the title, I, I brought up no immediate recollection for me. I have to say also to Shueisha canceling it at 99 chapters, a serious dick move there. Uh, not to even <laughs> think I have a 100 chapter milestone. Um, that's yeah, that's very interesting. I've just been looking it up, even as you've been talking about it, and it is, you know, it's a, it's got good reviews. People really seem to like it. The aggregator sites give it, uh, you know, high scores. We're talking like mid 2000 ticks, 2007 looks like something like that in that era. Ran for a couple of years, which would, you know, that's 99 chapters. Uh, and so, yeah, I, honestly, I, I have no idea why it was canceled. I, I couldn't say it, it. It it's a shame though. I mean, I, I'm going to read it now. Now that you've recommended it to me. Now I have to say this: since it was canceled, am I setting myself up for some serious, serious disappointment and rage if I decide to read this thing? You are definitely going to get an incomplete story, but even with that, I say it's worth it, man. the The 99 chapters that there are. I, and I know your manga taste and what you kind of like. You will love this. You will definitely love this. And anyone really, guys. There's there's a few sh- there's a few manga that I dream of ever resuming again. That you know maybe they do a Kickstarter or if I ever become a billionaire or something like that, I would just fund this. Mm. This is that one property in uh, Japanese anime and manga that I would just totally just throw money behind. Wow. So, high praise. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should read it. It does unceremoniously and very suddenly end. Like when the, when the cancellation happened, as it often happens in jump, they, he quickly ends it all of a sudden. He, he basically pulls a deus ex machina or a radicon or something and just closes it off. But it's clear that it was canceled. Everybody knows it. And the, the story had a lot of potential and power mm. left in. Well, that blows. Uh, just judging by the numbers I'm seeing on the aggregator sites of how many reviews it has, it may in fact be a case where this was a manga that was more popular in English than it was in Japanese, as sometimes happens. Uh, so, yeah, that's a real shame. MXO, I, I will definitely, uh, MX0 actually, right? MX0? Yeah, MX0. All right, I'll check that out. Uh, my recommendation, my first recommendation, is one that that we talked about briefly last week, which is uh, Spirit Circle, which is my epitome of the manga that is the perfect length. And it's by the great uh, Mizukami Satoshi, uh, most well-known for uh, Lucifer and Biscuit Hammer, maybe well-known to younger anime fans who may not be familiar with this manga as the creator of Planet With. Uh, which I let me say for the record, I really like Planet With. It's it's a good anime. He's he does he's done much better. And uh, Spirit Circle is without uh, without any kind of um, without any kind of exaggeration on my part. That would be uh, my that would be my third or fourth favorite. Well, maybe even second. It's in my top five. It's in my top five manga of all time. No question about it. Absolutely love it. Um, it's, it's again, it's perfect for anime. First of all, because it's great. And as a great manga, it would make a great anime. But also because it's a great length. It's just like, I think it's about 50, 55 chapters, something like that. It's not long. It, it could be even done really well in one core. But if you did two cores, it would be even better. But you, you could do a great version of it in 13 episodes. It's linear start to finish 
tells a great story. It's funny. It's romantic. It's warm. It's sad. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's just, it's just, it's, it's the best Mizukami series there is. And that's saying a lot because he's a genius. I, I just wish, again, there's no reason for a production committee to back this series now. That's part of the problem. Uh, because it's a finished manga, there's no it, you're not going to sell many more volumes by doing an anime version of it. It wasn't hugely popular to begin with, and uh, it it so it's never going to happen. But God Almighty, it's a great it's a great series. There were rumors that Biscuit Hammer was going to get an, an anime, maybe even from Gainax. Actually, there were a lot of rumors around that a few years ago, but uh, maybe a decade ago. That never happened. That was the one manga that people were talking about from him that might have a chance to get an adaptation. But Spirit Circle, it'll never be an anime, but it should because it, it it's just a remarkably, remarkably fantastic story. It, it involves time travel, but not in the science fiction sense, more in sort of a spiritual sense, uh, rebirth, uh, atonement. Uh, there it it you know it goes ancient ancient Egypt and and modern Japan and all kinds of other places in between. It's 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 just the imagination and the sheer. But the thing about Mizukami that I really love is he's a very humanistic. He's a very humanistic writer. He he really he he is a great believer in the decency of people, but at the same time does not over does not cover up the capacity of people for cruelty and shallowness, which makes a very interesting tone for his works. So, uh, Setsuken, I don't think you've read this one, but to you and to any of our listeners out there, uh, Spirit Circle, uh, highly, highly recommended. Yes, I actually did go back after you mentioned it last week and looked at some of the artwork. And one of the vibes I got from it is it reminded me of the unnecessarily 50 episode long series Twin Star Exorcists, just in in how the, the cover is and how some of Gosh. the like... Yeah, and, and the reason I mention that is not because I'm equating it to that, but from a very like outsider perspective, I'm surprised that Twin Star Exorcist got 50 episodes, and this series, which looks in some ways even more interesting, didn't get an anime adaptation. And I think while Twin Star Exorcist didn't do well, they did see something in it where they gave it 50 episodes, and half of that was completely anime original so i mean i think my hope for these kinds of manga is there will come a time when anime is in decline like we've mentioned sometime it'll happen it'll it'll burst the bubble will burst and when that happens and everything collapses i think when anime makes a revival it might go back to the well of older series like i think parasite got a adaptation at some point very very late uh, and and I think this might as well, and that's that's always my hope with manga that have finished are really good, but that haven't been tapped into. Yeah, and we have seen a little, almost a counterintuitive trend in the last three or four years of stuff like Ushio and Tora, uh, and and Parasite and other stuff like that, older series getting anime as out of the blue, uh, which I almost feel like is kind of an obstinate reaction among certain older members of the anime production community uh, maybe rebelling against this, uh, this massive trend towards light novels and, and isekai and other things. So who knows? Maybe you're right. Uh, I do think Parasite, for example, as an example, was a significantly more popular manga than Spirit Circle, but it could happen. Uh, you know, you, you never give up hope. I, I think the reason Twin Star Exorcist got 50 episodes is because it's the same thing we talked about earlier. It's just a much more popular manga to begin with. The manga sales on that were really good. And I think that's that's why it got a long adaptation. But who knows? Anything can happen. OK, so MX0 Spirit Circle, back to you. What's your next pick? So the next one I'll mention is Until Death Do Us Part, which uh, ended. Uh, let's see, when did it end? Ended a while ago. I, I actually never finished. It ended in 2015, but I actually read through most of it. And then I think it was at the point where scanlations were the only way to consume it, which is fan translations of manga. At the time, it was not uh, licensed or anything like that. Um, so that one is about a blind assassin uh, 
Uh, he's basically like, if you've seen the Marvel character Daredevil, he's like Daredevil in that he has this like hookup thing that allows him to see directly through his retina. He, he sees 3D models of stuff. And he's a kind of a gangster, uh, blind gangster dude that can do all these crazy things. And he ends up having to protect this uh, girl that has uh, like precognition powers. So she's a. So that whole thing, it's a very action packed manga. Mm. There's lots of cool action scenes. It's, it's, there's, uh, there's a bunch of different like enemies and groups that he has to kind of survive. And there's a cool bunch of side characters. It's a Senin or a Senin, however you say that. Uh, I always get it wrong, but it's, it's an adult, uh, story. And it, it was actually illustrated very, very amazing artwork by a guy named double s he's a korean uh artist Mm. and just this is a beautiful manga it's not it's not super deep i wouldn't say like this isn't something that you would watch uh it's more like i would say great pretender it's it's got like action it's it's a thriller and it it would be very fun as either a bunch of movies or ovas or like a very high budget like 13 episode series by uh, Madhouse or Mappa or um, maybe even Studio Wit, but everybody wants their manga to be a- adapted by Studio Wit. Well, uh, you know, there you go. And uh, I-, I think this one has a better chance than than either of the titles we've talked about so far, because you know you've got a writer there who's who's I think a little better known, and who actually did uh, who d- did Spriggan which I think is a quite a well-known, quite a well-known and popular manga that in fact, it wasn't there a, a remake. There was an ONA or an adaptation of that many, many years ago, but I think there was a recent, wasn't there a recent announcement of a Spriggan anime, a new anime of that coming out? I, I, I thought there was, I think David Productions or somebody like that. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that there is another Spriggan anime on the docket. Uh, yeah, I think they made a film in 1998. But I think That's there's, I mean. uh, yeah, I think there's actually talk of a new, of a new Spriggan anime series. Oh I'm yeah, you're right mistaken. by David Production. Yeah, I and, did not know that. And I don't know if you're as big a fan of Spriggan as you are of this one, but it's the same author. Uh, and that's a, that's got some penetration. And, and if that anime does well, then I think that bodes well for his other titles. I think we saw that with Ushio and Tora. Uh, eventually leading to Karakuri Circus getting uh, an adaptation, kind of a misguided one, but that's neither here nor there. So that one is it's an interesting choice. That one, I think of the ones we've talked about so far, that one's got a shot. That could happen. Uh, it's not totally impossible. So until death do us part, nice choice. Okay. The next one I'm going to pick is uh, the first one we've talked about that is an ongoing, which is Dungeon Meshi. Uh, do you have you read Dungeon Meshi at all, Satsukin? It's on my list of stuff that I hope either gets an anime or I'll just get to it and read it. Okay, so very good. Dungeon Dungeon Meshi, you know, uh, localized as Delicious in Dungeon, uh, another sign-in manga, uh, which I you hear a lot of people. It's Yen Press, by the way, has licensed this in English, so it is available. Uh, nine volumes so far. I hear a lot of people talking about this, including me, as how the hell has this not gotten a, an anime already? It's uh, it's extremely popular. It's extremely critically praised. It's been nominated for for several awards, and so it's it's got the book of the year award uh, or one of the book of the year awards a couple of years ago. It's a very interesting manga, and uh, I love it. It's uh, Ryoho Kui is the is the mangaka. It's about a dungeon scenario. All kinds of interesting twists, but basically it's an interesting cast of characters, almost like a D&D party, if you will, a halfling and an elf, yada, yada. But the the human, Elias, who's more or less the leader of the party, is very much of an oddball. And one of his obsessions is eating monsters. And uh, so it's got a very interesting, you know, cat girls and dwarves and the halfling character who is a hilarious guy named Chilchuck, who I love. It's just, um, it's a really f- extremely funny, very smart. And if you ever were going to apply the word quirky to a series, this series is quirky 
not squared, but cubed. It's extremely quirky. It's, it's, it's a really fun series, beautiful artwork. It actually did get an animated, it actually did get an animated advertisement not that long ago, which is often a precursor to an anime adaptation. And that got the rumor mill cranked up even harder. In fact, it was Trigger that did the, uh, that did the animated commercial for it. It's a fun series. It sells well. People love it. It's popular. It gets, it gets lots of critical praise. It's visually interesting. It's episodic. Uh, why this isn't an anime again, I can't, I have no idea. I can't figure it out. But Dungeon Meshy, Delicious in Dungeon, a really fun series. Again, among the ones we've talked about, this is one I think it it definitely has a shot to get an anime. I, w- I would say it's inevitable, but then again, it's so surprising that it hasn't happened already that I'm not going to jump to that conclusion, but it definitely should happen. Yeah, I think it will. It's Dungeons are really in right now, especially with the Isekai craze. It seems like it's cursorily related to the fantasy and the the kind of dungeon like vibe uh that's very in right now I, I mean even goblin slayer and some of that other stuff so just the fact that it has dungeon in the title i think is a huge thing but beyond that i have a question for you on this sure would you want trigger to animate this i would take an animation from anybody but shaft at this point i'd be thrilled to have it <laughs> um but trigger would not be my first choice yeah, I was going to say, I, it, looking at the manga and the artwork, it just doesn't seem like something... Well, they did do... Uh, what was that Magical Girl show? They did do that, but it just doesn't seem like their kind of thing. They're too bombastic and weird, I would say. And I feel like this is something that, you know, a more... Uh, like maybe a JC staff or something with a proper budget could do a lot better with yeah, Little Witch Academy probably I, I'm going to guess is the one you were referring to. Yes. Um, yes. Trigger, the Trigger is a little too snarky and smarmy and self-referential for me, and that to me is not a good match with the humor in Dungeon Meshi. It is weird, but not in the same way that most Trigger anime tends to be weird. I'm I've warmed to Trigger a little bit. Uh, you know, I thought Gridman was really really a good show. And I didn't dislike BNA Brand New Animal. That was that was pretty solid. But I, I I would love to see this. I mean, I'd love to see Wit do it. Wit would be my first choice. But Wit, as we know, is chronically never able to keep up with demand anyway. Another one I think would be great for this would be Kinema Citrus, who does the Made in Abyss ad- adaptations. Yes. Uh, who started off as a kind of a more, almost a spinoff of Bones. But yeah, even somebody like JC Staff, just a good. You know, JC Staff is not a platinum studio, but you, just a good, straightforward, very traditional, you know, anime studio that, that you know, that, that they can do fantasy. They can, you know, they, I think JC Staff would be fine. A1 Pictures, again, they would be fine for this. Um, and if it's Trigger, it's Trigger. I mean, like I said, as long as it's not Shaft, I'd just be happy to have an anime. But um, they would not be my first choice. No, they would not. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, anime, get right on that. We need a Dungeon Meshy anime and make that happen stat. Okay, and uh, what is your next pick, Setsuken? This will be my final pick because okay. I just didn't have any more. I don't read as much manga as you do. But um, going off the dungeon theme that you kind of set up for me quite beautifully, uh, the Dungeon of Black Company. And this, I would say, is probably the one that I think has the biggest shot of being made from my perspective and the most commercial viability because it is an isekai it's a manga though it's not a light novel it's an isekai but it's an isekai that does a really interesting riff on the the classic idea the riff here is that it's about us uh a, a rich billionaire guy a guy who basically is like you know one of those silicon valley people who who's been able to like invest in stocks and do all this stuff and basically hit it rich. And as soon as he does that, he basically gets transported to another world and he has to start in a dungeon at like the lowest slave labor level. And it's about how the economics of that world work and how he wants to get up to the top again. And you know how he, he actually has never worked a day in his life. So it's, it's a very, very interesting and off kilter concept. And the isekai thing is like 
as most smart ones are. It's just a device to explore much more interesting themes. Um, there's classism in there. There's economics. There's the whole concept of like dungeons, which I think something like Don Machi has done with like how dungeon could spawn its own economy. A dungeon could spawn its own economy. So all of that, I think, and with how popular that stuff is right now, I'm surprised at like five or six volumes. This hasn't gotten uh, that have been translated. I don't know how far it is in Japan. I've, I've read it in hard copy book form um, that this hasn't got an adaptation. Have you read or heard of this, Guardian Enzo? I've heard of it. I haven't read it um, because until somebody I trusted like you gave me that kind of recommendation, you know, it's not the sort of series based on the description that I would necessarily get into. But let me just say this. Uh, let me first ask you a question. Are you sitting down? Yes. There was an anime adaptation announced for this at the end of June. Oh, wow. Okay. So congratulations. Oh, Omedeto gozaimasu. Yay. The Dungeon of Black. Yeah. It's getting an anime. Yeah. I'm not surprised. So this is one of those things where, wow, I need to pay more attention. See, guys, this is why we have the anime news segment. <laughs> even I will miss things that are hugely important. Yeah, it seemed like the kind of... So I'm not, like, crazy about this, but I think it would work well as an anime. Um, like, it, this isn't, like, my MX0 moment, but or even, like, a ReZero Season 2 moment, but I think it will do well. It will be interesting, and I think for people like you that have been on edge, maybe watching the first episode will convince you to maybe take a look at this property. Well, see, I thought that was great. See, that was a moment. It happened in real time. I was able to deliver some good news. I'm always happy to be able to do that. Uh, and yeah, so I, I don't think there's too many details about this yet in terms of like of like when it's going to air. But there was an announcement, that, uh, I think, yeah, end of June. Yeah, there it is, June 30th. Dungeon of Black Company TV anime confirmed. So um, and I will say also that Mag Garden, where this is published, Magikami, uh, is a website that does a lot of, this is a web manga, generally, correct? It, it's, it's a web manga? I think it is. Um, it might have started that way, but when I read it, it was a proper manga with like uh, of hard copy volume okay. and In Japanese. really good art. Um, or in English, I believe so. Okay. Well, anyway, Mag Garden is a respected is a respected source for quality manga. Uh, so I'm I'm glad we had this conversation because now I will check out the anime when I see uh, when I see it on a preview, and I I might not have otherwise. So I'm very glad that happened. But there you go. So uh, here at no, at Notaku, we deliver the good news. We get results. We ask for we ask for manga to be anime. Not only do they get adaptations. But they get adaptations predated by a month from when we're asking. So, so there you go, uh, or two months. So, congr- so there you go. We deliver. Now, hopefully, we can say that about the other shows on our list. The last one of which, for me, I was going to say YKK Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko, which is maybe my favorite manga of all time. But since that already got an OVA, I decided to DQ it, and I'll go with maybe my second. Or as I said with Spear Circle, maybe my second or third. Definitely in my top five of all time, Vagabond. And uh, Vagabond, I did research this some time ago, so I know this to be true, is the top selling manga in terms of volume sold that has never gotten an anime. Uh, And uh, Vagabond, of course, is by Inoue Takehiko, uh, one of the greatest along with Mori Karu, I would argue one of the greatest currently working mangaka in terms of just pure artistic ability. Uh, and his other famous work is most famous work is slam dunk, uh, which is of course did get an anime. Um, and, uh, he is well known for taking hiatuses <laughs> and vagabond has been on hiatus. Ooh, a, Five years, maybe it was 2015 or so when the last chapter came out. He says he's going to go back to it. We'll see. He is actually back working even on Slam Dunk again, I think. Um, and I like Slam Dunk a lot. I'm a basketball fan, but Vagabond to me is his masterpiece. It's it's sold 82 million volumes worldwide. One of the best selling manga series of all time. Won the Osama Tezuka Cultural Award. Won the Kodansha Manga Award. You know, it, it couldn't be any more well-respected. And um, 
yet it's not an anime. Uh, and it's very interesting that it's not because people have said, oh, maybe maybe Takahiko Inoue doesn't want to let them make an anime because he's they're afraid. And he said no. And he literally said this in an interview a couple of years ago. No one has ever approached me about making an anime out of it. I have, you know, so he's at least open to the idea. And literally, as of that time, no one had even approached him. Um, this is the story of Miyamoto Musashi, who uh, is one of the most important figures of the Sengoku era, uh, came out of the aftermath of the Great Battle of Sekigahara, was a very young man, uh, ended up being one of the arguably the most revered swordsmen in Japanese history, but ended up devoting himself to art and and other things because he simply got tired of living a life where people would follow him around, challenging him to sword battles, and he had to kill them. And he didn't want to kill them. And he had to do it because he was constantly being challenged by people who wanted to test themselves against him. And um, this is this is based on a, no, on a novel, uh, well, not a novel, I'm sorry, but a written, yes, it is a novel, a novel that was written as sort of a fictionalized version of uh, Musashi's life. He's turned it into a manga. And again, the novel is a little bit uh, is a little bit fictionalized, and then the manga is a little bit more fictionalized. But it, it, the the core elements of Musashi's life are there. Um, it is, along with Otayome Gitari, I would say, in my view, the most beautiful manga ever written. It's incredible artwork, incredible characters, incredible backgrounds. It's unequivocally, unequivocally to me, a masterpiece on every level. I sincerely hope he finishes it someday. Uh, he says he's going to go back to it. Uh, we'll see if it ever happens. The larger question then, will it ever, will it ever get an anime? Well, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. 82 million volumes speaks a lot. It is, it's one of the greatest selling manga of all time. Uh, so it's certainly possible that it could get an anime. Whether it actually will or not, I don't know. It is an anime, a manga that would be very hard to do justice to, just like Otome, Otome Gitari. The artwork would be difficult to do, but maybe a series of movies would be better where you could go at it with a theatrical budget. But you know, it's it's 37 volumes. Movies, you're not going to get anywhere close to doing justice to the story, which is, which is there's there's maybe five chapters or 10 chapters in the whole of the whole list that maybe are not essential that drift a little bit, but on the whole, it's all pretty on point. It's all important. It, it covers not just Musashi, but several other characters as well in, in some detail. Uh, what is your background with Vagabond? If any, Setsuken, do you know the series at all? Oh yes. Oh, uh, I mean, even though I, I don't read a lot of manga, this is one of those. So there's three series that I feel have, needed to get anime adaptations two of them have already gotten it and this is number three so the first one was berserk berserk did not get good anime adaptations but it's similar in scale the manga it's not as good i think neither of the neither of the three are as good as this one but um uh, neither of the other two but um it, it's scale it's hard to translate into anime without putting a huge budget behind it um, the other one, it, which did get a really good adaptation, was um, uh, Vinland Saga. So Vinland Saga and then Vagabond is number three for me as a series that I just hope Wit, because Wit tackled the impossible task of handling Vinland Saga, which I thought they can't make an anime of this. It's just it's just going to be too difficult to do it with the large scale battles and, you know, the artistic stuff and how deep and adult the story is. I think this story is less, in some ways, less hard to sell to people. But but I'm, I'm still very much not surprised that it's not get, gotten an anime adaptation. The subject matter is probably so important to the Japanese as well. Nobody probably wants to risk messing it up. So um, I, I, I know recently in video game land, they came out with a uh, video game called Ghost of Tsushima, which is all about samurais and stuff like that. And a lot of the Japanese game developers are like, this game is amazing. It was made by a Western developer. And they're like, this should have been made in Japan. It, it feels so Japanese. It feels so authentic. And I think 
the samurai and that specific period and all that stuff that is my suspicion for why this hasn't gotten an anime um it would be a very difficult challenge but maybe with netflix or amazon i i my money was on maybe amazon funding this back when they were still green lighting big cool projects one of those two big players maybe because i i think netflix has already dabbled in samurai shows i feel like they could just you know, green light a series and then just keep going with it, going with it, going with it. And maybe, you know, it'll give them the returns that they expect. But yeah, you need serious money to even attempt to try this. Yeah, you know, in some respects, I think that it makes it even more puzzling because we see Sengoku is such a hugely popular subject uh, setting for anime. You think, like you said, I mean, you think that would be an easy sell, but... I think it is an intimidating manga from the perspective of of a data adaptation, both because of its length, because of the in, because of the incredible detail in the artwork, because of how of, of how revered the subject matter is, because of how revered the manga is, and even uh, even the original novel, uh, you know, the original A.G. Uh, Yoshikawa novel that is is revered. So, um, yeah, it's intimidating. It scares people. I understand that it scares people. Um, I think Netflix, I agree. They would be a good call for this because I think this is something that could be very popular in the West. If you made an anime out of it, this is something that you could easily see be popular on Netflix. You could see it be popular on Amazon. You could even be, see it being uh, popular on Toonami on Cartoon Network, something like that. Adult swim, whatever you want to call it now. Uh, American Western audiences, French audiences, they would love this. Um, and it is a manga, I think, that does have a fan base in the West already. Uh, I think a lot of Westerners know about this manga. It is licensed, of course. Um, so yeah, um, this this one, it it would be a it would be a big bite of the apple. It would be a great choice, even production IG. Uh, yes, production IG is a good it one. basically is wit, but you know, two different sides of the same coin. Um, somebody like that, you're not going to go to Studio Dean or Pro and say, or JC Staff and say, hey, great, do this. Or you'd end up with Berserk and that would be a crying shame. This needs to be a big time studio. It needs to have a big name director and it needs to have a lot of money behind it. But if you could put all those things together, if someone was willing to take the gamble and we know anime is very risk averse right now, uh, that could be, that could be big time. I think I think he could make that money back. I really do, and it's good to know that Inoue is willing to at least listen if somebody approaches him. <laughs> but until somebody approaches, we'll never know. So there you go. That's our that's that's our topic this week of a manga that would make great anime. And Lord knows there are many many more where those came from. Yeah, I think we should do several volumes of this in the future, and maybe um, our listeners can let us know if they like this um, and if they read any of the manga then they should definitely comment and let us know and we'll we'll talk about it as we love listener feedback, right? Yeah, we absolutely do. Uh okay, there you go. So, uh, what I wait now what is I I hear listeners in my ear right now saying what's that? Uh, we didn't get enough manga this week? Well, that's good to know. Okay, uh, as you Requested more manga. Uh, this is something as opposed to our deep dive, uh, not specific to, to manga that make anime, but just a, my manga recommendation corner for this week. I like to do these when I host because there's so many manga I, I want to I want to uh, evangelize. And the one I want to talk about this week is a manga called Watashi no Shonen, uh, which is localized as My Boy, and it is in fact licensed in English by Vertical. And there are six volumes of it available, uh, so uh, that which is fantastic. You can read this in English. You can read it in the original Japanese. And uh, the author on this is uh, Hitomi Takano. And this is a manga. If you, I don't instinctively say, oh, you have to trust the aggregator sites, but. If you do go and go to look at where this is reviewed on aggregator sites, the reviews are great, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because you may read the, the synopsis or you may read the first chapter or two and you may say, it's not for me. Don't. Uh, so Watashi no Shonen is a story about an adult woman and a young boy 
starts out about 12 years old when the series starts. And there are a couple of progressions in there, not to spoil, but it takes place over a good period of time. But it's not an age gap romance and it's not icky. And it's, that's not what it is. It's, it's a story about uh, two lonely people who connect and who, uh, you know, have gaps in each other, in their lives that the other person helps to fill. Uh, you know, the boy is kind of forgotten by his father who dotes on his brother and there may be some other issues there. And this is a woman who's kind of struggling to find herself and hasn't had any kids. She's about 30 when the series starts. Um, so read and don't judge is my advice with Watashi no Shonen. Uh, you'll immediately be struck by how beautiful the artwork is. The artwork is fantastic. That's that's a given. But the story itself is also fantastic. It's much deeper than you would think, but judging by the description. And it, it goes into this. Both characters are very, very strongly developed. And then there's a, a core of sporting characters who also get a lot of development. But basically, it's about these two people and their relationship and them as individuals and society and how it judges such things and it's ongoing in japan it's uh, i think about eight volumes in the original japanese and six volumes of which have been licensed in english could conceivably get uh could conceivably get an anime someday it's not impossible i think the 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 the, the despite the fact that the anime or the series is much more than than people might assume it is, they might get scare off anime a little bit. The fact that people may may say it's oh it's controversial, blah blah blah. <clears throat> I hope it gets. I hope it does get uh, an anime someday. It's not a bad seller. It does pretty well. Uh, it's already been nominated again for manga taisho and such things. So it, it's possible. Uh, but again, it's a series as many of the manga I recommend are that you sort of have to give a little time, get into it, read several chapters. The one other piece of advice I would give with this one is don't skip the author comments in the manga because they're absolutely fucking hilarious. Read the author comments and the author interview stuff because it's really funny. So any, any, uh, have you looked through this one at all? Yeah, I looked through it uh, when I saw it in the docket, and the biggest question you answered for me was the whole age gap romance thing, because the 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 little synopsis on manga updates really freaked me out. The whole are these feelings that of maternity, or is it something else? So I'm glad you told me that that's not the focus, because I actually have all, there. There's a few manga and anime that have covered the concept of, you know, uh, a middle-aged person taking in a child and, you know, being a kind of father figure or parental figure. And I feel like I'm still waiting for the manga or the anime that actually capitalizes on that idea perfectly. Well, I will say he's not an orphan. He's got, he's got a father. He's got a grandmother. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's not, it's not so much that question but the question of their feelings for each other, and let's be clear, um, I think it's natural that with an adolescent, with, with an adult of the opposite sex, it's possible that there can be other complicating feelings involved there. And, and those are not ignored by any stretch of the imagination. But if you look at something like Koiwa Ameyagari no Yoni, which we both had a little, a little squiggly reaction to when it started, we were wondering, oh, is this going to go there? And we both ended up loving it. Uh, because it handled the subject with sensitivity and intelligence. And it's exactly the same with Watashi no Shonen. You get that little initial squee reaction, and then you realize how intelligent and how sensitive the treatment is, and you say, oh, yeah, well, I'm certainly glad I stuck with that. Yeah, so you just needed to mention Koi wa Amegori and sold, just like you did sci-fi for the last one, man. That that was the sell. That was the pitch. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And also... And just realize too that Koiwayame Agari, she's 17 when that story started, and he's 12 with this one. So there's a definite difference in the focus in terms of where the potential romantic element could play into it. It, it it's definitely not the same in that sense, but it is a real it's a complicated and beautiful and deep relationship between an adult and a teenager um that that does not get lost in tropes and cliches and titillation. 
So in that sense, that's where I think we see the common ground. So there you go. That's my manga recommendation for this week um, is Watashi no Shonen. And the author, again, is uh, Takano Hitomi, available from Vertical in English. Uh, all the places you consume your anime, either electronically or physically. And I encourage you to go out there and check it out. And yay, Enzo gets to talk about manga again. That's always a good thing. So, uh, okay. Uh, and with that, we can sort of start to ease our way. We can begin our pre-landing check sequences as we, as we, as we glide toward the finish of another podcast here on Notaku. Okay, so this is the portion of our broadcast where you, the listeners, weigh in. And as you know, we love to hear from you. So please submit your comments via YouTube, via any of our podcast channels, via our websites, via Twitter, Patreon, wherever you like. This week, we have a question from our YouTube follower, Num Num. Thank you, Num Num, for submitting this question. And his question is, or her question, I don't know. Uh, how do you enjoy an anime manga after you've gotten spoiled unintentionally? Uh, and I might even add as a sort of a follow-up to that question, how do you enjoy an anime manga after you've been spoiled intentionally? Because I've been spoiled both ways, and I'm not sure from my perspective it makes any difference. I'm still equally pissed. So do you want to answer this one first, Satsuken, or do you like me to go ahead? I'll go for this one. Go I have for to it. say, before, before we jump into the answer, I have to applaud Num Num for the questions he keeps throwing at us. They always make me use my little noodle a little bit harder. So thank you for that. Um, as for the question, oh man, have I got a, f a few stories about that? So I think we both are anime bloggers and we both run anime websites. And the way I've gotten unintentionally spoiled, I've never gotten intentionally spoiled. Unintentionally spoiled is in the comments of either my website or on Twitter or on Facebook. And when it happens, it's the most gut punching thing I can think of. Um, I was blogging Fairy Tale and. When the first season ended, uh, and before the second season came on, somebody just came into the comments and wrote the entire story for the next arc, spoiled everything. And then somebody did it again in the second series when uh, they spoiled a big reveal near the end of the series. So when that happened, it just ruined so much for me. I don't think I enjoyed the anime or the story as much as I would have. Some of the things that were supposed to surprise me just didn't. And I tried my best to kind of imagine how I would have reacted to it when it happened. But honestly, there's no cure to it. People do that. People who spoil things for other people deserve a special place in hell. It's just a really jerk move. And I have not found a great way to deal with it. I just kind of have to live with it. And you're like, you know, bad stuff happens in life. So that's been my situation. What about you, Guardian Enzo? Yeah, pretty similar story. I mean, both through LIA and Random C. Random C is a, ugh, that's a spoiler. That is an absolute spoiler minefield there. I've gotten spoiled that way. And Twitter, don't even get me started. I, I basically feel like I have to just, turn off Twitter. If there's anything I don't want to get spoiled on, I just feel like I have to leave, leave Twitter behind. So, you know, I, I remember like very specifically with Hunter Hunter when I was covering that, which I was covering all the time at LA and eventually at RC as well. There were some big things I got spoiled on. Like for example, in the uh, Chimera Antark, gone, gone's portion of it and, and what he did, at the end of, in order to facilitate, I won't spoil it for you, uh, the audience, I know you know, but uh, what Gon did at the end of that arc to, to, to develop himself to the point where he could do what he wanted to do, uh, which is a pretty big reveal. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's people out there who think, oh, the, you know, the anime series, well, of course that was never in the first anime series, but they think, oh, the, you know, this happened years ago in the manga. Of course, everybody knows it. Well, you know, F you, no, we don't. Um, and I intentionally fought hard to keep myself as unspoiled on Hunter Hunter as I could. And I think one of the things that people really liked about my coverage of that series, some people hated it, some people liked it, but the ones who liked it, I think a lot of them liked it because I was giving unspoiled commentary on it. I was, you know, I, this stuff was hitting me for the first time. Uh, so to be spoiled on something like that, 
it's rough. Now, Hunter Hunter is a great enough series that I could still find plenty that absolutely enraptured me about it, even knowing that. Uh, but there is no hot magic button you can push to say, oh, I'm going to cancel out the irritation and disappointment I feel over having been spoiled and enjoy it just as much. No, depends on the situation, depends on the series, depends on the spoiler. But generally speaking, when you get spoiled, be it unintentionally or intentionally, it does deflate the experience somewhat. And that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, as webmasters, one of I mean, one of the things we have to do is troll patrol our comment sections for spoilers so that other people don't get spoiled because that's part of our job as if you will the gatekeeper i know that's a loaded word but one of our job let's say the catcher in the rye we have to try to as we can to protect our website readers from being spoiled by comments so sometimes in the act of doing that we get spoiled ourselves and that's happened to me on more than one occasion but you know i have to take that shit out um it's a shame it sucks. Uh, we can, I have learned, like I say, if I'm watching something where, where you just get the feeling that there's a big cliffhanger or something big is coming and you sort of know it, I just tune out Twitter at least. Uh, so at least I don't get spoiled there because Twitter is, Twitter is absolutely death for spoilers. There's, it's just because it, people just go out on their timelines and they just think, Oh, I, I've seen it. I, I can talk about it. Well, well, you know, there's a lot of time zones in the world and people DVR stuff and they watch it online and they stream it at their own pace. You know, I'm not, I, I it's not, I can say it's wrong for people to tweet out their feelings about something like that, but it does suck for those of us who see those tweets, you know, and are you, I'm, you're not as much of a sport. We talked about this. You're not as much of a sports fan as I am. I'm a huge, no, sport. I, I only watch sports anime. Right. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I watch a lot of like English Premier League. I love soccer as an example. And so I watch a lot of English football, English soccer uh, on delay. And because the matches will oftentimes, if the match starts at like 11 at night, my time, depending on what my next day looks like, I might just watch it. But some of those matches start at two in the morning in Japan. And I'm not going to watch a, a soccer game at two in the morning. I, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and you know, because of who I follow and people who maybe like the same team or the like sport, I've learned that if I plan to watch a sporting event the next day on delay, I can't be on Twitter because I'll get the result. And it's exactly the same thing. It's, it's a sports spoiler is basically what it is. So it's just part of life in the electronic age. Uh, we live in a, in a global community now where everything is real time. If you don't want to be spoiled, you have to tune yourself out as much as possible but if you are spoiled, it just, it just, it's, it is what it is. You're not going to enjoy stuff as much. That's just how it works. So num num, that's my answer. It's the same as Satsukin's. It's, it sucks. And there is no way uh, to enjoy it as much if you've been spoiled. It just, it's, it just, it's just, you just have to try to avoid that minefield as much as you can avoid it. I agree. Avoid, avoid comment sections, avoid uh, websites, avoid Reddit. Just avoid everything. I know with Game of Thrones, I had to do that. I was a day behind sometimes, and I would just not go on the internet that day. Yeah, and that was a challenge for me as the as the blogger blogging Game of Thrones because I'd read the books, so I wasn't worried about myself being spoiled, but I had to patrol the comment sections despite my repeated warnings for the people who hadn't read the books. A lot of spoiler comments in the comment sections that I had to delete. Um, I, why is it that... Why are people so intent on on giving spoilers here's the problem as i see it is a lot of people will say oh it's not a spoiler because blah, 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 blah. no fuck you it's a spoiler uh, how many times have we seen that over the years oh it's not a spoiler because well yes it is a spoiler and then stuff people have this perception because they already know but they can somehow convince themselves that it's not a spoiler <laughs> but believe me if, if you have to say and oh and this is one of my favorites i don't know if this is a spoiler if you're asking, it's a spoiler. It's a spoiler. Yeah, I yeah. agree. If you have to, if you have to justify it or ask, err on the side of caution. Comments like that are the reason I have a box right above the anime of all comments that literally says, "Don't discuss the source material if it's not in the anime. Just don't talk about it at all." And even then, people get to it. I will say, on a more positive note, I do appreciate the commenters or the manga readers who see something in the anime and see you know 
something was cut out or if it was different and they add that information into comments. Totally. Those are some of the best comments I get where I haven't read the source material. And somebody will say, did you know this extra scene was in the anime or in the manga or the light novel that never made it to the anime? And that adds a lot of context or it explains something. Those people are the almost the y- the yang or the yin to, you know, the the evilness of spoiler people. Yeah, no, no, I'm with you on that. And and if it's already happened in the timeline and they skipped it, that's I to me that's fair game. Okay, absolutely. And that as you say, that even adds color and context, so that's fine. Now, sometimes they reorder things in the anime and put that scene in later. So in effect, it was a spoiler of sorts, but I don't blame people for posting those because you can't assume that's going to happen. Um so if they skipped it, I that's fine that even if it ends up being a spoiler because the anime puts it in later um I'm okay with that because uh because you can't assume that that's going to happen and and it, so that that's 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 okay. Uh, there you go. So thank you Nam Nam we appreciate that as always uh and we can again say submit your comments via my Patreon patreon.com guardian enzo you can submit them on the YouTube channel you can uh, animeevo.net or uh, animeevo.net. Yes, I'm forgetting all of a sudden. Yes, and anime-evo.net. Anime-evo.net or lostinanime.com or lostinamerica.net uh, or either of our Twitters at Setsukin or at Guardian Enzo, all one word. We love questions. Submit your questions. And uh, again, uh, for those of you who are asking about getting us indexed on the various podcasting sites, we're, we're, we're on there, CastBox. Uh, we're picking up others, but it's going to take a little bit of time before the listings come through. And it's something we're always developing. We're always building. Um, so, so, so stick with us on that. If you have not questions, but suggestions about things you'd like to see us do, or, or just general comments about the direction of, of the podcast, by all means, uh, submit those too. And we may even talk about them on the air, but even if we don't, we definitely love to have them and, and they can be very good uh, sources of ideas for us going forward. Uh, and again, uh, we're always out there uh, at uh, Anime Evo and Lost in Anime and uh, looking forward to uh, speaking with you again in future weeks. Setsuken, any last thoughts of our uh, Setsuken, any last thoughts for our readers uh, and our listeners this week? Uh, yes. The one thing I will say is I apologize for how late last week's episode was. Uh, real life got in the way a little bit. We will try and hit a t- by Tuesday every week. So, um uh, apologies for that. We're still ironing out some of the kinks. And thank you to everybody. We're getting more subscribers. We're getting more views. So continue to do that. I love you all. Okay, there you go. And best kink song, Waterloo Sunset. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for listening. Uh, we really appreciate it. And as always, stay frosty. We will be back with you next week. Bye-bye.